introduction to the Avalanche virtual machine preparing to live stream. All right, cool. And we are live. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, great to see everybody here. Am I? Yep, I'm muted here. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, great to see everybody here. We're really excited for this one. Uh, we know that there's there's no sponsorship, there's no bounty associated with this. But again, you know, Chainlink is a, uh, a blockchain agnostic tech technology. And there's an integration currently happening uh, with Avalanche right now. So we're, we're super excited to hear more about the virtual machine, hear more about how Avalanche works and building DeFi apps there. And we have Gabriel from the Avalanche team here with us to, to teach us more. And we're really excited to dive in. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. It's a great honor. Can everybody hear me and see me okay? You sound perfect. Awesome. So thank you so much for having me. My name is Gabriel Cardona. I am the developer evangelist and senior test engineer from Ava Labs. And today I'm gonna to be giving the presentation introduction to the Avalanche virtual machine, the AVM. And we will discuss what Avalanche is as a platform and why we think it's such a big leap forward. And then we'll do a bit of a deep dive into the Avalanche virtual machine transaction serialization format and see what it takes to create transactions on the Avalanche virtual machine. Real briefly before we do that, a quick introduction to myself and all the labs. So who am I? As I mentioned, my name is Gabriel Cardona and one of the many masks that I wear is developer evangelist. So I go around to hackathons and conferences and conventions and meetups. And I give presentations with the intention of on-ramping developers into our ecosystem. And I am personally of the opinion that there is really no more valuable asset on the planet at this particular moment in time than a really good developer. And the reason I feel that way is we're at the time in the evolution of our species where we really need to solve problems at scale and velocity. And because of the many, many breakthroughs in computer science we've had over the last 50 years, we have intellectual raw material unlike any time in all of human history. So what we really need is creative and hardworking people to build the systems that solve the problems. And so that's why I spend a large part of my time just trying to inspire people to build amazing things. So if you take only one thing away from my presentation today, please have it be the following. There's never been a better time in all of human history to build something amazing and to change the world. So go do that and do that on Avalanche. So that's my personal pitch. Who are we? Who is Ava Labs? So uh, Ava Labs is a world-class team of experts in the fields of computer science, economics, law, and finance primarily based out of Ithaca, New York and New York City, though myself, I'm based on the west coast of the United States in San Francisco. And we really are a global team. Um, I work with teammates all over the world. I don't think that we have every single continent covered, but we definitely have some serious coverage. And as you might imagine, of course, we are hiring. So if you're in the fields of computer science, economics, law and or finance, and what I talk about today resonates with you, go check out avalabs.org slash careers or the final slide of my presentation today actually has my contact information. Um, we're always looking for creative, hardworking, smart, competent, easy to get along with people who wanna have a radical impact and change the world with their life and their work. So again, if what I talk about today resonates with you, feel free to reach out to me personally, that's totally cool. So that's a brief introduction on myself and uh, Ava Labs. Let's dig into this introduction to the Avalanche virtual machine. So a great place to start is the question, what is Avalanche? So Avalanche is a global financial network for the issuing and trading of all digital goods. And we enable millions of validators to process thousands of transactions per second with near instant finality. And we do that using a protocol which is completely green and quiescent. And then we paired this high throughput, very fast finality protocol with a architecture which can meet the needs of unique financial products and decentralized applications. And we do that through this notion of subnets. So subnets allow anyone anywhere to spin up a tailor-made network with custom virtual machines and complex validator rule sets. So Avalanche really lays the foundation for this platform of platforms with thousands and thousands of public and private networks all emerging into this global marketplace, which we call the internet of finance. And I wanna uh, do a very brief history on the um, evolution of the blockchain revolution. I find that sometimes it's very valuable to understand where you've come from so you can truly appreciate uh, where you're gonna go. So I wanna kind of briefly walk through the history of the blockchain revolution so we can get a sense of where Avalanche is gonna take us. I suspect that these next few slides won't really be news to anybody watching this right now, but maybe we'll learn something. 
So blockchain 1.0, as we all know, was Bitcoin. And Bitcoin proved to the world there was this need for a robust and a decentralized payment platform. It's clear that Satoshi was spot on. He, she, they, it changed the many people's lives greatly, myself included. I definitely fell down the Bitcoin rabbit hole into a world of wonder from which I have never emerged and I suspect I never will emerge. The problem with Bitcoin is that it's slow. It only does a handful of transactions per second. It doesn't have fast finality. You need to wait to maybe up to an hour or so before you can be confident your transaction has settled. And it's really just hardwired to do payments. So it kind of does tokens, okay. And it kind of does smart contracts, but it's really primarily focused around this notion of payments. So that's blockchain 1.0. Of course, blockchain 2.0 is Ethereum. And so Ethereum is a decentralized application which allows other decentralized applications to launch on top of it in the form of a smart contract. And to appreciate why that's a big deal, you kind of have a have appreciation of how challenging that was to do prior to Ethereum. So prior to Ethereum, if you wanted to launch your own smart contract or decentralized application, you really had to spin up your own network. And that led to a very bespoke environment where none of these networks were able to get the network effects needed to tip and then ultimately go mainstream. And clearly Ethereum changed that led to a, a huge wave of innovation around tokens, initial coin offerings, decentralized finance, oracles, and so, so much more. Avalanche is a blockchain 3.0. And similar to Bitcoin and Ethereum, we are introducing a handful of new paradigms, which we will now briefly discuss. So the first one is, in the old way of thinking, there was one blockchain and one set of validators. So you can think about BTC and its miners, or you can think about Ethereum and its miners. In the Avalanche world, Avalanche is this heterogeneous network of many different blockchains and many different validators. So the first thing to wrap your mind around is Avalanche is a platform of platforms with net compound network effects. And then the second thing to wrap your mind around is in Ethereum, you launch your decentralized application as a smart contract. And in Avalanche, you launch your decentralized application as a virtual machine. So you may be wondering right now, what is a virtual machine? So technically speaking, a virtual machine defines a state machine. So you have the state of your blockchain, a state transition function, um, transactions, and then an API through which users can interact with your blockchain. But in a more general purpose sense, you can think about a virtual machine as the application level logic of your blockchain. And uh, this logic can be pretty much whatever you want. We don't put a lot of limits on what you can do regarding the uh, application level logic of your blockchain. So really the creative space out of which you can pull your virtual machine is nearly endless. Um, developers who launch their applications as virtual machines get a few different benefits. So the first benefit is that you're not boxed into using a language like Solidity or Viper. Um, you can use more modern tooling, which fits better in with the rest of your uh, workflow. So for example, you can use Golang or Rustling or C++ or whatever you want to use. The second benefit is that as an application developer, you don't have to worry about the underlying networking. You don't have to worry about the underlying consensus. You don't have to worry about the underlying state of your blockchain. All of that is handled for you by the Avalanche network. And each one of these virtual machines launches on its own blockchain. So a blockchain is really an instance of a virtual machine or another way to say it is a blockchain runs a virtual machine. And virtual machines can be instantiated into many different instances of this blockchain. And then each blockchain is validated by exactly one subnet. So that's the next paradigm to wrap your mind around. What is a subnet? A subnet is a dynamic set of validators working together to achieve consensus on the state of a set of blockchains. And subnets are incredibly powerful. They manage their own membership. So for example, whenever you spin up a subnet, two of the things you pass in are a threshold, so a number, and then a, a lexicographically sorted array of addresses. So for example, you could pass in the number two and three addresses. And so that sets the stage to say, this is a, a, a network that nobody can make any changes to. They can't add any blockchains. They can't add any validators unless two of these three addresses sign a threshold control signature. And the ability to have public permissionless networks and permissioned private networks opens up this entire other world of having legally compliant networks. So for example, imagine being able to say, 
this set of validators has to be located in this legal jurisdiction, all within the United States, for example, or this set of validators all needs to meet certain KYC AML requirements, or this set of validators all has to have certain hardware requirements because we're creating a very powerful network, or this set of uh, validators all have to have certain professional licenses or something like that. So you can imagine um, how powerful subnets are. And so the way you can sort of think about this hierarchy is a virtual machine is a blueprint for a blockchain. It's the application level logic of your blockchain. A blockchain is an instance of a virtual machine and a virtual machine can be instantiated many different times. One blockchain is validated by exactly one subnet. One subnet can validate many different blockchains including many different instances of the same virtual machine. And then one validator can belong to many different subnets both public and private validating many, many different blockchains, including many instances of the same virtual machine across a bunch of different public and private networks. So just from that data, just from that visualization right there, you can get a sense of um, how rich and diverse in character the entire network can be. Heterogeneous is really the word that describes it the best. And then the last paradigm to wrap your mind around, to wrap your mind around is avalanche consensus. So consensus is the process by which a series of independent validators come into agreement on a decision. And it's a very, very rich field of computer science. It goes back at least 40 years. And there have been really three major paradigms in the world of consensus. The first is what we call classical consensus. It has extremely high throughput, very fast finality. It's lightweight and it's green and quiescent. However, it doesn't scale well. It's not decentralized and robust and it doesn't perform well in adversarial conditions. When Satoshi Nakamoto launched Bitcoin in 2008, 2009, the world got turned on to, to Nakamoto consensus. And Nakamoto consensus is very robust and decentralized, but it doesn't scale that well. It certainly doesn't have high throughput, a handful of transactions per second. It doesn't have fast finality. It takes up to an hour for your transaction to settle. It's not lightweight. It's definitely not green. Uh, we all know the meme of BTC burning more energy each day than some nation states. And it performs okay in adversarial conditions up to 51%. A couple years ago, there was really a breakthrough in distributed systems and a new form of consensus emerged called avalanche consensus, which uses repeated random subsampling. And it is really this perfect storm of all of the features that we want. So it's scalable and robust and decentralized. It has extremely high throughput, thousands of transactions per second, very fast finality, often less than three seconds, sometimes a 50th of a, or a 20th of a second. It's a very, very lightweight. You can run it on a Macintosh or a PC or some little small VPS droplet out on the cloud. Um, it's green and quiescent. We use proof of work for civil protection. Instead, or I'm sorry, we use proof of stake for civil protection instead of proof of work so we don't burn a bunch of energy. And it performs very well in adversarial conditions. And um, we have this really great data visualization here. I'm going to play. Uh, this was created by Ted Yin, who is one of our co-founders and is our CTO. Uh, previously, Ted was the creator of Hot Stuff, which is actually the classical consensus protocol, which is behind Facebook's payment network called Libra. And uh, he now is at Ava Labs working on Avalanche consensus. And he created this. Ted is actually one of the most knowledgeable engineers I have ever worked with. If you happen to see this, Ted, thank you so much for the opportunity to be on your team. It's a great honor. Um, but what you see here is that this grid represents a bunch of different nodes. And the color represents their current proposal. And when I press play here in a second, they're going to start randomly and repeatedly subsampling each other. And they will either flip their color from orange to blue or vice versa, or they will make their color darker depending upon the conviction of the current proposal. And so you can see that it only takes a few rounds of sampling and everything tips and then avalanches into consensus. Actually, I want to watch that one more time because it's really a thing of beauty. So you can see that it only takes a few rounds of random repeated subsampling and then everything tips and avalanches into consensus. So hopefully that gives you a bit of an intuition around how avalanche consensus works. So um, that was the sort of high level of what we are. We're a network of networks with compound network effects. We have this idea of virtual machines and then you can instantiate virtual machines into subnetworks. And then we also have this breakthrough called avalanche consensus, which gives us extremely high throughput and very, very fast finality. Now I wanna kind of look at what we call our default network or our primary subnetwork. So this is the network which is currently live today on Everest and which will be live when we go to mainnet. 
And um, we ask that all validators validate transactions on the uh, default network. And then whenever you spin up your own sub networks, you can have a separation of concerns between your validator and other people's networks. But we ask that everybody validates transactions on the Avalanche network. So let's dig in a bit here. The Avalanche default network has three blockchains. In the center, you can see the X chain. That's for exchanging assets. And if you remember our architecture, a virtual machine is a blueprint for, an app, uh, for a blockchain and then an instance of it is called a blockchain. So this X chain is an instance of our Avalanche virtual machine, which we're, we're gonna be digging in a bit later. But anybody who launches their network, even today on Everest, if you go today and launch your own network, you can launch an instance of the Avalanche virtual machine, not the X chain. So again, um, it's a blueprint, which we show an instance of. Some details about the exchain. This is where our native token Avox was issued. So Avox is a fixed cap asset. There will only ever be 720 million Avox ever. We use them to send value between the network. We also burn them for fees and we ask that validators lock them up or stake them in order for their node to process transactions and ultimately receive rewards for that. Um, the X chain is what's called a directed acyclic graph. So if you need extremely high throughput, parallelizability, prunability, and you don't really need smart contracts, you're more interested in doing like asset exchanges, a directed acyclic graph is the data structure for you. If you need total ordering and smart contracts and still high throughput, you wanted to use a linear blockchain, which we also have. Um, on the X chain, you can issue your own asset. So if you wanna issue a variable or a fixed cap asset, if you wanna launch a food token and there will only ever be 21 million food tokens, you can do that. If you wanna launch a food token in the future, you wanna issue more uh, food tokens for whatever reason, you can do that as well. And then you can also launch um, non-fungible tokens and collectibles. And then you can do cross-chain atomic swaps as well, which we'll dig into in a bit. So that is our X chain, it is for exchanging assets. If you look to the right, you'll see our C chain, that is our smart contract chain. This is an instance of the Ethereum virtual machine and it's a linear blockchain. So it has snowman consensus. If you have a directed acyclic graph, you have avalanche consensus. And if you have a linear blockchain, you have snowman consensus. Um, it is 100% byte for byte backwards compatible with existing EVM applications. And if you are building anything with existing Ethereum developer tooling, so Truffle or Remix or MetaMask or Open Zeppelin, et cetera, it should be as simple as you launching your contract onto our smart contract chain and pointing your instance of MetaMask at our C chain. Because it's an instance of the EVM, you can do everything you can do on Ethereum. So you can do uh, NFTs, you can do ERC20 crowd sales and um, tokens, you can do decentralized apps, you can do yield farming and decentralized finance, et cetera, et cetera. So, we expect the C chain is gonna be a very, very rich engine of innovation as well. If you look on the left-hand side, you will see our P chain. So this is our platform chain. You can think about it like our administration chain. It allows you to stake your AVOX for a certain amount of time up to a year. We have between seven and 12% inflation over this next year. So if you lock your tokens up for longer, uh, you can validate transactions and ultimately be rewarded in the issuing of new tokens. It not only allows you to um, have your node become a validator, but imagine a different scenario. Imagine you're somebody a bit less technical or you don't really think you can keep a node up and running for a full year or whatever. Uh, we allow you to delegate your funds to an existing validator. And whenever you do that, that increases the weight of that validator, which increases its chances of being sampled by its peers, the statistical chance of being sampled by its peers. Uh, the P chain is a UTXO system, but it is a linear blockchain. So we do snowman consensus. A couple other things you can do there, you can create subnets. And then on these subnets, you can, of course, instantiate the virtual machines into blockchains. And then lastly, you can add uh, validators with complex validator rule sets. And then one more thing, there's a thin red line connecting all three of these circles. And what that signifies is cross-chain atomic swaps. So cross-chain atomic swaps are really this holy grail of our industry for, for many years. You can imagine how much value is siloed in BTC and how much value is siloed in Ethereum. And it's not incredibly obvious how you move value back and forth between those two networks. But in Avalanche, it's baked into our core protocol to be able to move value between the different networks. So today you can have some Avox on the X chain. You can send some over to the C chain, immediately launch a smart contract with Metamask and, Rem uh, Metamask and Remix. You can send some of your funds over the P chain and stake them and immediately be validating transactions. And it's on our roadmap in the future to allow cross-chain swaps in and out of the different networks as well. 
And so again, we are a network of networks. And so you can imagine this world, this um, internet of finance, where there are thousands and thousands of these different public and private networks, some of them running thousands and thousands of instances of blockchains. The ability to have rails to move value in and out of these different networks is incredibly powerful and is going to lead to compound network effects. And so we're pretty excited about that. Okay, so um, that, this whole entire presentation is gonna be an exercise in going from the general down to the very, very specific. So, you know, we, we kind of backfilled knowledge on what is Avalanche as a platform. Then we kind of looked at our default subnetwork and what it consists of. Now I want to start drilling down to the actual Avalanche virtual machine. But before we do that, there's a couple more bits of information I want to backfill. It's simply because we'll discuss them later in the journey. And I think it's good if we have an understanding of what they are. So first, let's talk about the cryptographic primitives, both at the networking layer and in the Avalanche virtual so, machine. So Gabriel, just to just jump in here real quick, for everybody mm -hmm. watching, I, I see a couple hands raised. Um, if you have a question, feel free to drop it into that Q&A feature uh, at the bottom of your screens. Um, so Gabriel's gonna take questions at the end, but yeah, definitely, uh, definitely put those questions in there, uh, but just know that uh, we're gonna get to them later. So thanks. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Um, yeah, basically I, I prepared this and I don't want to break my train of thought. So if you have any questions, please drop them in and we'll definitely get to them at the very end. Okay, so real quick, cryptographic primitives in the networking layer and in the Avalanche virtual machine. So at the networking layer, we use transport layer security certificates to protect node to node communication from eavesdropping. And it's really important to note that the Avalanche network is not dependent upon any third party service providers like certificate authorities or issuers or authenticators. Every single certificate, which is used in the networking layer for identity is self-signed. And this creates a truly self-sovereign identity layer for the Avalanche network. And that's very powerful. Secondly, um, we use your TLS certificate to identify your node, but we don't really wanna store your entire TLS certificate on the blockchain. So what we do is we take the DER representation of your TLS cert, we SHA-256 hash it and take the di resulting digest and RIPEMD-160 hash that. And then we take the resulting 20 byte representation and base 58 check encode that and prepend that with the string node ID dash. So for example, if you have ever run your own full node and you uh, hit the RPC call um, info dot get node ID and it returns node ID dash and then some base 58 check encoded string, that's what you're seeing is uh, basically the DER representation of your um, certificate hashed and then uh, encoded and prepended with a string. Um, it's important to note that um, if you have fired up a full node, so it, for example, if you're using Avalanche Go, which is our full node software in your home directory. So if you're on like a Unix system, for example, and you say CD space tilde and you're in your home directory and then you say LS space dash A and it'll dump all of your files, including hidden directories, you will see a hidden directory dot Avalanche Go. And in that directory, you will find a staking directory. And in that staking directory, you'll find a TLS certificate and a private key. You wanna back that up. Um, it's a best practice to back that up in case your node goes down or something and you lose that, you can always reproduce your node ID, which is used, <clears throat> which is uh, critical for staking and rewards. Um, also worth noting in your uh, hidden directory of your home directory is your user's key store. It's just saved in level DB. So there's no single file you can back up. But if you have called keystore.create user over the RPC at any point, or you've called avm.create address or platform.create address, you can call, um, keystore.export user, and it will export your user and any associated X or P chain private keys and addresses. So again, this is a best practice just in case your node goes down for some reason, you won't lose your users, any of their associated private keys and addresses and or your, um, your node ID for staking and rewards. Uh, in the future, very soon, we will have ledger integration and you'll be able to sign transactions from our web wallet. And so it will then be probably an anti-pattern to have users on the full node but for now, as a best practice, if you have users on your full node, or if you care about maintaining your node ID, make sure to back up those two things, your user's key store and your TLS certificate and private key. Okay, so now let's talk about the cryptographic primitive at the Avalanche virtual machine, as well as the platform virtual machine. The Avalanche uh, virtual machine and the platform virtual machine are very similar in nature. So we use the SECP 256 k one curve on ECDSA key pairs and we have sec p 256 k one addresses. So basically we take the 33 byte representation of your pub key and we SHA-256 hash it, take the resulting digest, ripe in D160 it, take the resulting 20 byte representation and BEC32 encode it. We're big fans of BEC32. I think that Peter Wool previously at Blockstream did an absolute great job. So BEC32 is base 32 encoded instead of base 58. It's character insensitive. 
Uh, it's easier to compute. There's no big mem operations. It's got uh, better checksums for, um, it's got superior checksums for prime power. It's 17% larger than base 58 check, but it's actually smaller when encoded in the QR. And lastly, it's in use in systems today like BTC and Tor and I2P and others. And now it's in use in Avalanche as well. So big advocate of BEC32, big fan of Peter Wolf and Blockstream. Thank you for your work also on HD wallets. Absolutely mind blowing. Uh, secondly, we have SecP 256K1 recoverable signatures. They're 65 bytes. And we use this same cryptographic primitive for uh, variable and fixed cap assets as well as NFTs. They technically have a different credential ID, which we'll briefly discuss in a moment, but it's the same cryptographic primitive under the hood. It's a 65 byte SecP recoverable signature. Okay, so that is the um, cryptographic primitives that happen at our networking layer, TLS certs, TLS addresses, and then the cryptographic primitives at the AVM and the platform VM level. Basically we have SecP addresses and um, recoverable signatures. So if you remember the way our, our architecture works, a, a um, virtual machine is a blueprint or the application level logic for a blockchain and then a blockchain is an instance of a blue of a uh, virtual machine. So the, the Avalanche virtual machine again is simply the blueprint. Anybody can spin up their own instance of the Avalanche virtual machine on any network that, that they want. Our instance of the Avalanche virtual machine is called the X chain and it's for exchanging assets and it's on our primary um, our primary network. So now I want to dig in a bit and show what the actual transaction serialization looks like to create transactions on our network. So a, a big design pattern of our entire system is that it's very modular and composable. So for example, you can launch your own subnets. You can launch your own virtual machines on those subnets. You can have your own validator rule sets. But even within the Avalanche virtual machine, it's very modular and composable. So you can kind of think about it like this multi-dimensional set of Legos. And once you develop an intuition about how all of the different pieces fit together, then you're empowered to create these very rich and diverse transactions. And we'll dig into a couple of examples here in a second. But real quick, some of the things which are native to the Avalanche virtual machine so first, uh, this is where our token AVOX was issued. So as I mentioned, AVOX is a fixed cap asset. There will only be 720 million of them ever. We use them to pass value back and forth through the system. We burn them in the form of fees. And then we also ask validators to stake them for an extended period of time to enable their node to validate transactions and be rewarded with the issuing of new tokens. So the AVOX token is issued on the X chain, but of course, because of cross-chain atomic swaps, you can move it back and forth between the P and the C and the X chain today and the future into subnets as well. But a really, really cool uh, feature of the Avalanche virtual machine is this idea of feature extensions. So the, the state that you see the AVM in today may not be the same state that it's in the future because we have this ability to plug in uh, different feature extensions. So right now we have three we have SecP 256K1 um, variable and fixed cap assets. So again, if you want to issue a food token, there can never only be 21 million food tokens. You do it as a fixed cap asset like Avox. If you want to issue more food tokens in the future, you do it as a variable capped asset. Our second feature extension is non-fungible tokens. So of course, non-fungible tokens are very, very valuable. And there's been an absolutely huge explosion in NFTs over the last three or four years. Um, very popular on Ethereum. There's been entire networks dedicated to NFTs. NFTs can be collectibles or playing cards or items in a supply chain or individual contracts. Um, they can really be anything. anything. Anytime you need like a single representation of something across the entire system, a non-fungible token is your play. And we have them baked into the core part of our protocol. So that's very cool and very exciting. I've seen some really great demos with NFTs on Avalanche. The third property or the third feature extension, I should say, is properties. And this one is really powerful. So properties allow you to add non-transferable tags to addresses. So for example, imagine saying this address belongs to a US citizen. And so that's why I was saying properties in concert with private subnets will, will what will ultimately enable these uh, legally compliant subnetworks. So that's how you would be able to say all the validators in the subnet all need to be in this legal jurisdiction, jurisdiction. They all need to meet these KYC AML requirements. And every single address needs to have a property that shows that it has a, a certain professional license. Um, that doesn't downplay the ability to launch permissionless networks on Avalanche. Of course you can do that. I just was highlighting the ability to launch permissioned networks as well. 
And what's really cool is feature extensions are an open-ended thing. So you can keep plugging them in uh, on the X chain, which is our instance of the Avalanche virtual machine or on your own. If you launch an instance of the Avalanche virtual machine on your subnet, you can plug in your own feature extensions. So what are some potential feature, ex feature extensions? How about zero knowledge proofs and ZK snarks? So what if you wanna launch a privacy centric network? You can absolutely do that on Avalanche. What about quantum safe crypto? So, you know, in a few years when Google's quantum computer goes mainstream and all of a sudden everything breaks, well, what if we plug in quantum safe crypto? Uh, how about BLS SIGs? How about Schnorr SIGs? You know, the list really goes on and on and it's up to you to kind of imagine what you would plug in there. And one more really cool thing <clears throat> is that our assets can have multiple feature extensions. So it may be nonsensical to say I'm launching a variable capped SecP asset that is also an NFT, that, that doesn't make sense. But you could totally imagine launching a variable capped asset that allowed either SecP signatures or Schnorr signatures, right? So um, our different assets can have multiple feature extensions and we feel like that's very, very powerful. And then lastly, the um, last feature which is core to our Avalanche virtual machine is cross-chain swaps. So, you know, I mentioned earlier, cross-chain swaps are really a holy grail of our industry. Being able to move value in between networks can lead to compound network effects. And we have that baked directly into our core protocol. And we'll check out what that looks like here in a second. So now I wanna actually, um, so, you know, to recap here, a, our AVM is an instance of, a, of, of the, um, our X chain is an instance of the Avalanche virtual machine. And if you remember, a virtual machine defines a state machine. So there's the state of the blockchain, a state transition function, transactions to trigger the state transition function, and then an API through which users can interact with the blockchain. So because you use transactions to trigger these state transitions and these decentralized applications, we have this entire family of transactions which allow you to do all of the different things I've talked about. And as we explore this more, you'll be able to see that as you're doing one of these, you can actually do uh, other operations as well. So even if you're doing an import or export, you can still move assets around that kind of thing. So it's pretty powerful. Um, let's dig into this a bit. So the base transaction, I conceptualize this as a parent class of which these other transactions extend as children. I know that's not exactly how it works in the Golang code base, but the reason I conceptualize it that way is everything that a base transaction has, a create asset transaction also has, but then it has some other stuff to create asset. And the same goes for the other three as well. So that's why I kind of think about it as a parent class and subclasses. Um, what does a base transaction contain? So uh, we'll look, we'll actually see the bytes for this uh, at the very end, but I'll, I'll quickly articulate what it has. So a base transaction has a two byte codec ID. We've done a really good job of versioning all of the, much of our API with the codec ID. So in case we need to go to a different version at some point in the future. So a base transaction has a two byte codec ID then it has a four byte type ID. The type ID for base transaction is zero, create asset transaction is one, operation transaction is two, import is three and export is four. And what's really cool about our transaction serialization is that the validators have total information awareness of the different assets that they are validating. So they know what type of transaction it was, they know exactly the asset ID, they know how much they're moving around, they know the different type IDs of the UTXO, which we'll discuss on the next slide. And so the reason that's pretty powerful is because on the default subnet, you stake Avox and you burn Avox for fees and Avox is our main token. But you can imagine creating a subnet where maybe you ask people to stake a different asset or maybe the uh, validators partake in fees of a different asset. Maybe they don't burn them, maybe they do a different thing. Again, you can create your own complex rule sets, but the point is that because of our transaction serialization format, the validators have a lot of insight into the assets that, are, that they're moving across. Um, the next, uh, after the four byte type ID, a base transaction has a four byte network ID. So again, we are a network of networks. So we encode the network ID into the transaction and that's for routing the transaction to the correct network. After the four byte network ID, we have a 32 byte blockchain ID and that's encoded into the transaction for replay protection. So if anybody has ever dealt with a fork um, they're probably giving me a hug across the internet right now. So we encode the um, blockchain ID directly into the transaction. So there's zero chance that somebody can replay your transaction on a sister or a mirror chain because that sister or mirror chain would have a different blockchain ID, which would make the, your transaction invalid. So that's pretty cool. If you're a network of networks of blockchains, you have to account for replay protection. We've done it in a very nice way. Um, after the 32 byte blockchain ID, we have a variable length array of um, transferable outputs. So, you know, the AVM is a UTXO system. So we have inputs and outputs. Um, 
So we have a variable length array of transferable outputs. And then after that, we have a variable length array of transferable inputs. So that's how you use the base transaction to send assets back and forth. You can consume inputs and then create new outputs. And then lastly, we have a two, up to 256 byte memo field. And um, so you can imagine if you're sending a transaction to a bridge, for example, maybe you would tell the bridge what to do in that memo field. Or maybe if you're doing, if you're like an exchange and you're doing official bookkeeping, you could do that in the memo field. Um, it seems pretty simple, just a memo field, like what's on a check, but it's actually been a big in engine of innovation in the Bitcoin and the Bitcoin cash spaces. So Bitcoin and Bitcoin cash have this notion of op return. And in BTC, you can write 80 bytes of arbitrary data to the blockchain. And in Bitcoin cash, you can write 220 bytes of arbitrary data to the blockchain. And that has actually ended up being hugely innovative. The identity uh, systems and the token systems that exist in those ecosystems are driven by this ability to write just a small amount of data to the blockchain and then have some client which can you know pull it out of parse it and make sense of it. So we have a 256 byte uh, memo field and we expect it's going to be a big engine of innovation, even though it seems very simple and it's going to be interesting to see what people do with that. So of course, that's the base transaction, as I mentioned, has um, inputs and outputs. So basically, this is how you can send assets back and forth. But as I mentioned, these others sort of extend it is the way I think about it. So create asset transaction also has a two byte codec ID and a four byte type ID and a four byte network ID and a 32 byte blockchain ID and transferable outs, transferable ends and memo. But after the memo, then you can pass in a name, you can pass in up to a four character symbol, you can pass in um, a denomination and then you pass in what are known as initial states. And we'll speak briefly about initial states on the next slide. But initial states basically are the UTXO that you're sending. So if you're issuing a new token or creating a new asset, you uh, add the UTXO to the initial states. Um, operation transaction is for minting and transferring assets. Of uh, So you can mint SECP assets, you can mint NFT assets, and then you can transfer NFT assets. And again, it extends the base transaction. So not only can you mint new SECP assets and mint new NFTs and transfer NFTs, you can also transfer back and forth AVAX as well as transferring back and forth variable and fixed cap assets all in the same transaction. You can do that with any of these. Um, next, we have the import transaction. So whenever you call import transaction, you pass in a, a lexicographically sorted array of addresses and then you pass in a source chain. So imagine this scenario, we wanna send money from the C chain to the X chain. So when I call import transaction from the X chain, I pass in an array of X addresses and then I pass in the C chain as the source chain. And whenever you are moving funds between any chains, we have this notion of an atomic UTXO set. And so whenever you call import transaction, you pass in your array of addresses in your source chain, it will then go retrieve the atomic UTXO from the atomic UTXO set and you can import them and then create new outputs on the X chain. And the export transaction is basically the mirror of that. So you pass in an array of addresses on a different chain, you pass in a destination chain. So for example, we wanna send money from X to C we can pass in a, um, a C address and then pass in a source or the destination chain as the C and that will send UTXO into the atomic UTXO set. And then on the C chain, you can call import transaction and import them into the C chain. So that's kind of the way it works. And again, they all extend base transactions. So as you're doing an export transaction, you can also send SecP assets back and forth. You can also send AV AVAX back and forth, et cetera. So that is the um, different transaction types on the Avalanche virtual machine. I really briefly want to speak about the platform virtual machine uh, as well, simply because the transaction serializations are relatively similar. So if you remember, our default subnetwork has an X chain, a P chain, and a C chain. The, um, the P chain is the platform virtual machine. And we do not expose a base transaction, like you don't see base transaction at the root here. And the reason is this. If you want to exchange assets, you should be using the X chain. That's what that's for. And so, um, we don't want to enable people to start sending money back and forth on the P chain because we consider that an anti-pattern. So for example, if you wanted to send money from P address one to P address two, the pattern would be P address one to X chain, X chain to P address two. So you would do a cross chain swap there twice. And that's simply because we wanna encourage and set the pattern in the convention that if you want to exchange assets, you use the X chain. And so we don't expose the base transaction, but in the code base transaction is there because we want all of these different classes to have that functionality. So when you call an import transaction on the P chain, it still has a two byte codec ID, a four byte type ID, a four byte network ID, 32 byte blockchain ID, variable linked array of transferable outputs, variable linked array of transferable inputs, and then a 256 byte memo field. 
and then the stuff which is unique to an import transaction. So an import transaction is an array of addresses lexicographically sorted and then a source chain. And export is the same thing, extends base transaction, pass in an array of addresses and then pass in a destination chain, very similar to what we saw in the AVM. So not much to uh, talk about there. But the others of course are unique to the platform chain. Um, the first is add validator transactions. So this allows you to stake some AVOX and to have your nodes node ID uh, start validating transactions and being rewarded for that. And when you call the add validator transaction, you pass in that node ID, which we briefly discussed on the TLS um, cryptographic primitives for the networking layer slide. And we talked about taking your DER representation of your TLS cert and ultimately encoding it in base 58 check and then prepending it with that string. This is where that comes into play. So we spoke about that. Uh, some of those cryptographic primitives would come up later in our journey. So the first one is the node ID. You pass it in as to the add validator transaction. You pass an end time and a start time and then a certain amount that you want to lock up and an address which will receive the rewards. And then lastly, you pass in a delegator fee rate. And that's used for the next one. So again, I had discussed a scenario where maybe you want to run a node for a full year and you have the technical competency to keep it up and keep it secure, et cetera. Um, maybe somebody else just doesn't want to take that responsibility on, but they still want to be able to lock up some of their funds and get some, some rewards. So they are able to delegate their stake to your validating node. When they do that, that increases the weight of your node and increases its um, statistic chances of being sampled by its peers. So the add delegator transaction call is very similar to the add validator transaction call, except it, it does not have that final parameter, which is the delegator fee rate. Uh, regarding create subnet transaction, you basically pass in two things here. You pass in your threshold and your array of addresses. And this allows you later to be able to instantiate virtual machines as blockchains, add validators, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, create chain, chain transactions, what it sounds like, you pass in a subnet ID and then you pass in a virtual machine, right? So let's imagine we just spun up our own subnet. Now we want to launch our own instance of the AVM. So we call create chain transaction. We pass in the 32 byte subnet ID that we just created. And then we pass in AVM and we can instantiate the AVM on our own subnetwork. So it's just like the default subnet network has the X chain. You can launch your own instance as well. And then lastly <clears throat> is add subnet validator transactions. So this is once you've created your own subnet and once you've instantiated some blockchains on it, you can then start adding your own subnet validators. The one thing that we request is that all validators validate the default subnet. So you'll be validating transactions on our P, C and X chain. And then um, launching your own private subnet allows you to have a separation of concerns where you can only validate the transactions and smart contracts and decentralized applications on your subnet. You don't have to validate transactions for every other smart contract. And we think that's a pretty powerful pattern. So um, now I wanna briefly discuss uh, the different types of transferable um, objects in the AVM. So if you remember briefly, I had said that the base transaction has a two byte, two byte codec ID, four byte type ID, four byte network ID for routing transactions, 32 byte blockchain ID for doing replay protection and then a variable length array of transferable outputs, which is the first thing you see here. Um, in our system, we have four type of outputs. So we have SecP mint outputs. These are type ID six. We have SecP transfer outputs. These are type ID seven. We have NFT mint outputs. These are type ID 10 or A and hexadecimal base 16. Or we have NFT transfer outputs, which are actually 11 decimal or B in hexadecimal. That's their type ID. Um, regarding transferable inputs, there is currently only one type of transferable input. It's a SecP transferable input. The type ID is five. And then regarding transferable operations, we have three transferable operations at the moment. We have SecP mint operation, which is type ID eight. We have NFT mint operation, which is type ID 12 or C in hexadecimal. And then we have NFT transfer operation, which is D in hexadecimal or lucky number 13. And so um, the reason I mention all of these different type IDs is again, the validators have total information awareness of the different assets they're moving. They know the transaction type, they know the network, they know the blockchain ID, they know the different assets and how much they're moving around and they even know what types of inputs and outputs they're using. So there's really great awareness on the validator level. Um, briefly, we had talked about initial states on the two slides ago. So when you call a create asset transaction and you pass in an array of initial states, an initial state is basically a feature extension ID and then a variable length array of outputs. So for example, if you want to launch a new SecP, um, 
uh, asset, the feature extension would be zero because sec p variable ca capped assets, the feature extension is zero. If you want to launch a non-fungible token, the feature extension is one. If you want to launch a property, the feature extension is two, et cetera. So as we have more feature extensions, um, zero knowledge proofs, post-quantum cryptography, BLS sigs, Schnorr signatures, they will all uh, be plugged in with the different feature extensions into this initial states. So that's the way initial states works. Uh, UTXO is a standalone representation of an output. So basically there is a transaction ID and then an input of which UTXO or which output you want to spend. And then there's an asset ID and then there is a, an address account and an address indices. So you might imagine if it's a multi-sig, for example, the count of addresses could be two. And then you say, I want to choose the first address and the fifth address, uh, for example, to sign this transaction. So that's the way a UTXO works. And then lastly, we have credentials. So credentials are really for signing transactions. Uh, currently we have two credentials. We have SecP credential, which is type ID nine. And then we have NFT credential, which is type ID 14 or E in hexadecimal. Um, as I mentioned under the hood, they both use the same cryptographic primitive, which is SecP 256K1 recoverable signatures of 65 bytes in length, which we'll see very soon. Um, but that sort of gives you a sense at a high level of exactly the different components in our system, right? So we have base transaction, create asset transaction, operation transaction, export transaction, and import transaction. And then we also have similar transactions on the platform VM. And then these are the transferable outputs, which we have SecP mint output, SecP transfer output, NFT mint output, uh, NFT transfer output. For inputs, we have SecP transfer input. For operations, we have SecP mint operation, NFT mint operation, and NFT transfer operation. So I think that's the super high level. I wanna give everybody credit who stuck through that with me. Thank you so much. Um, now I kinda of wanna end on a very uh, clear, I, I wanna kinda of bring this into focus and show an example of what we just spoke about. So if let's say for example, today you go on the Everest network and you use our web wallet and generate an address and you take that address and drop it into our uh, faucet and you get a drip from our faucet and it gives you a transaction ID. You can then take that transaction ID and you can go uh, use the RPC call um, avm.gettxstatus, and that will return you one of three answers. It will either be dropped if the transaction wasn't valid for some reason, it will be processing if it's still making its way through the, through the flow, or it will be accepted. If the answer is accepted, then you can take that same transaction ID and you can pass it into avm.gettx, and it will return you a large base 58 check encoded string, which is your transaction. If you then decode that base 58 check encoded string into hexadecimal, you'll get what you see on your screen here. And though this may look like a bunch of gibberish, it is in fact every single thing that we just spoke about in a base transaction. So it has a two byte codec ID, a four byte type ID, a four byte network ID, a 32 byte blockchain ID, a variable length array of transferable outputs, a variable length array of transferable inputs, um, a two, up to 256 byte memo field, and then a set P credential and 65 byte recoverable signature. So everything I just discussed is on this screen. Now we're going to decompose this into its individual components so you can get a sense of what I'm talking about. So first, um, two byte codec ID, four byte type ID, it's zero of course because it's a base transaction. Uh, four byte network ID, so 30, 39 in hexadecimal is one, two, three, four, five in decimal. One, two, three, four, five is our local network. So you can use, we have a great developer tool called Avash which allows you to spin up uh, local networks of five or 10 different nodes on your computer and do testing. So I, I created this transaction on my local computer. That's why the network is one, two, three, four, five. Um, it has a 32 byte blockchain ID for replay protection. This blockchain ID is the exchange blockchain ID on the one, two, three, four, five network. Next, it has a variable length array of transferable outputs. So anywhere in our protocol in our transaction serialization format where something is a variable length, so either a string or an array, there will always be a four byte length prepended in front of it. So you can see that there is one item in this array of transferable outs. And below that, we check out the very first item. It has a 32 byte asset ID, it starts with three nine. So that's actually the asset ID of Avox on our local network. The type ID is seven. So this is a sec P transferable output. There's an amount, you could take that and decode that into decimal to see how much we're spending. Um, there's a lock time and a threshold. So I spent a lot of time during this presentation talking about launching decentralized applications as virtual machines on Avalanche, but we're so much more than that. We're also a platform for launching smart assets. And so you can see whenever you create an asset, you can lock it up to a certain time in the future, 
or you can do multi-sig so you can prevent it be spent unless a certain threshold is signed. Um, so you see the lock time, it's eight bytes, it's zero. So this could be spent immediately. The threshold is one. So it's only gonna take one signature in the future to sign this. And then I pass in a variable length array of lexicographically sorted addresses. And you can see there's one, and then there's that 20 byte representation, right? TLS uh, uh, set P addresses. Um, it, we take the 33 byte public key, uh, hash it with SHA-256, hash that with ripen D160, and you have this 20 byte representation. Um, next, we have a variable linked array of transferable ends. So you can see there's one, it has a transaction ID. Uh, it's pointing to the very first UTXO. That asset ID, you can see it starts with 39. So that is the Avox asset ID on our local network. It's type ID five. So this is sec for, uh, set P transferable input. Again, there's an amount that you can decode into decimals so you can see how much I'm consuming. In this particular transaction, the difference between what I consume, the amount, and the amount that I send is going to be burnt as a fee. So there's good, it, it's good to have an awareness about that. That's how we pay fee transactions. It's just the difference between the amount in and the amount out that gets burnt as a fee. And then lastly, uh, as I mentioned, there's a number of address, into, uh, of address indices. So it's one, and then we're grabbing the first address to sign this input. And then lastly, uh, as I mentioned, every single transaction has up to 256 byte memo field. And because it's a variable length array, of course we have four bytes that show how long it is, that's E which is 14 in decimal. So the next 14 bytes are the memo field. If you take that memo and you uh, decode that to ASCII, you'll see it says avalanche.js. That's what that string is. And then lastly, there is a credential. So again, it's a variable length array. So there's one credential. It's type ID nine, which is sec P. And then there's a number of signatures. And lastly, you have a 65 byte sec P recoverable signature. I do want to point out, because I've shown this a couple of times on Twitter and people kind of freak out and they go, whoa, man, I haven't seen Hex since I was in the seventh grade trying to crack video games or something. And I'm like, yeah, I, I gotcha. You do not have to create transactions in this format. Um, the brilliant Colin Cuchet from our team has created Avalanche JS, and he's done a really great job of mapping all of the high level data structures, which we just discussed into object oriented TypeScript. So I don't want to scare anybody away and thinking that you've got to write stuff in hex in order to interact with the Avalanche blockchain. That's definitely not the case. Um, we have high level object oriented modern web developing tool, uh, tooling that you can use to do this. I just wanted to give a sense of what it looks like at the low level. And ultimately, if you write your own clients, you would be producing hex like this. So um, that's pretty much it. I just want to summarize real quick again. So Avalanche is a global financial network for the issuing and trading of all digital goods. And we enable millions of validators to process thousands of transactions per second with near instant finality. And we do that using a protocol which is completely green and quiescent. And then we pair this high throughput, very fast finality protocol with an architecture which can meet the needs of unique financial products and decentralized applications. And we do that through subnetworks. So sub subnetworks allow anybody anywhere to spin up a tailor-made network with custom virtual machines and complex validator rule sets. So Avalanche lays the foundation for a platform of platforms with thousands and thousands of public and private networks all emerging into this global marketplace, which we call the Internet of Finance. So uh, I want to give a lot of gratitude to the Chainlink folks for having me today. It's really been a great honor. I also want to give a lot of gratitude to the Ava Labs team. Nothing but love there. Um, before we go, there is, in fact, one more thing. So, um, as many of you know, our mainnet is very, very close. The official date has not been um, announced, and unfortunately, I cannot give it to you today. But suffice to say, we are very, very close, close to going live with our mainnet. And we want to give as many people as possible the opportunity to play around with the network and see what Avalanche can do. So, at the current moment, it is 1254 Pacific Standard Time, um, September 15th. 2020, I'm in San Francisco. So for the next hour, starting right now at 1254, anybody who reaches out to me on Telegram, Twitter, or over email, we will give you $10 worth of mainnet Avox to go explore and have fun on our network with. So that's it. I'm Gabriel Cardona. I'm the developer evangelist at Ava Labs. You can reach out to me on Twitter or Telegram at CG Cardona, or you can email me at Gabriel at avalabs.org. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you so much. There was, uh, there was definitely a, a ton of really, really important and, and really insightful information here. Uh, so Gabriel, I know we only have a couple more minutes left, but um, if you want, uh, we have a good number of questions uh, racked up down in that Q&A feature. 
Sure, so I'm scanning right now. So I see, is there a cap on max delegation amount? If so, roughly how much? So, you know, um, I don't know that there is a cap on delegation, but I believe um, we have, so currently the, like what's live right now on the Everest network, the uh, minimum delegation and the minimum validation amount are the same. And we know that's not practical. People who validate are mistake a lot more than people who delegate. And there's like this extremely long tail of people who want to delegate. So just today we um, discussed changing the minimum delegation rate to a very low, uh, I don't know if it's public yet, so I'm not entirely sure if I'm free to say it, um, but it's, it's, it's low, it's, it's approachable for you know, your average person. Um, regarding a maximum delegation fee or rate, um, you know what, I don't actually know that we have one. Um, I'll find out about that from my team, but I don't know immediately offhand. Um, it says, do we need to create user key store for staking or staking through web wallet is enough once the main net starts? So uh, currently the ledger application is being security audited. So I don't think it's gonna be live uh, initially with our main net, um, but it will be live very soon after that. And then you will be able to do staking over the web wallet using a ledger. And so you won't have to create a key store on your uh, main machine. Um, let's see what else we got. It says, if the staking period expires for a validator, does that mean all the delegators to that validator are canceled or paused? Okay, so when a validator uh, spins up, you know, when they call add validator transaction, they pass an end time, a start time and an end time. Um, the end time, maximum end time at this current moment is one year. And so whenever you call add delegator transaction, your start time and your end time, <clears throat> pardon me, your start time and your end time need to be a subset of the validator start time and end time. So um, Avalanche Go will actually complain to you if you try and add an end time, which is beyond your validator's end time. So that's not a scenario that you should find yourself in where a validator spins down their validator and then there's other people delegating to them. Um, currently, once you spin up a validator and you say, this is my start date and this is my end date, you're pretty much locked in until that end date. We have it on our roadmap in the future to, be, to allow people to change those uh, values. But right now, um, whatever you said is your end date is your final end date and you're as a delegator you cannot create an end date which is beyond that time all right uh, it says how often are validators going to get rewards from their node validators will get rewards uh whenever their staking period is over so you lock up your funds for the entire period and then when it's over you'll get your validator rewards and if you are a delegator and you delegated to a validator when your delegation time is over you'll get back your initial stake you'll get back your rewards uh, sans any delegation fee that the uh, validator charged you. Uh, how much functionality is actually live? So today on Everest, we have the X chain, the P chain, and the C chain. Uh, I, everything I mentioned today is live on the uh, X chain. You can't yet do cross chain of swaps into subnets, but you can create subnets and launch uh, virtual machines on them. Um, you can do cross chain swaps between PX and C. You can run smart trans contracts on C. Yeah, pretty much everything I spoke about today, other than being crushing swaps in and out of subnetworks, is live today on the Everest network. Um, let's see here. It says, are delegators going to be able to delegate their stake to nodes run by all the labs? You know, that's a great question. I, I don't know the answer to that. I do know that there's a general um, vibe amongst the team that we don't want to do anything which seems unfair to the network. And so perhaps it would be considered unfair if we allowed a bunch of people to delegate to us because that would increase our stake or something like that. So I don't know offhand, but I know in general, there is this sense that we want the network to be very democratic and that um, we want to appear fair to all the different players in the network. So I think that's it. Uh, okay, a couple more transaction costs. So currently you burn Avox to uh, pay fees. Today, um, burning, uh, we, the fee is 1 million nano Avox. In the future, the intention is to have fees be a function of transaction size, similar to Bitcoin and uh, the number of signatures. Um, so that's the future plan. Okay, I think that's it. It's been an hour. I don't want to go over. Thank you so much. Awesome. Gabriel, thank you so much for being here. Yeah. Uh, again, if, if you guys have more questions, he put his, uh, his Telegram, his email there. Um, thank you so much. This was fantastic. For all of those who are part of the hackathon right now, uh, again, you know, the Avalanche is, is definitely a platform you can start building on as well. So um, we'll be excited to see some projects here too.
Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thanks again, everybody. Take care.